Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the sixth and final campus conversation of the year. Um, I was just asked, uh, is this the first time you've done this? And no, this is the sixth time this year, and I think probably the twelfth uh, altogether. We started this series uh, in the fall of 16 and um, continued it this year and expect to continue it um, next year. Uh, the goal of the Campus Conversation series is to have faculty and students and staff engage with each other about some of the big issues of our time going on now and affecting all of us. As a community dedicated to social justice and diversity, we come together to try to understand current events and talk about these issues. Today the topic is the hashtag MeToo movement and sexual harassment. We are privileged to have with us today a distinguished and exciting panel. We will begin with professor and head of the Department of Criminology, Law and Justice, Dr. Beth Ritchie, whom I will introduce in a moment. Um, she will provide some background and begin the conversation. Dr. Ritchie will be followed uh, by short presentations by our panel panelists, uh, Dr. Paul Shuey, um, who is an associate professor in the Department of Crimin Criminology, Law and Justice here at UIC, uh, Dr. Natalie Bennett, director of the UIC Women's Leadership and Resource Center, and finally, Shahrazad Tillett, photographer and executive director of the Chicago nonprofit, A Long Walk Home. The panel members will present and then we'll have some discussion uh, among themselves, after which we will open it up uh, for Q&A from the audience. Paper has been provided uh, on, the, on the seats so that you can write down your questions and we will collect them um, during the panel discussion uh, and utilize them during the Q&A session, which will probably start around 1 p.m. Um, it's now my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Beth Ritchie. Dr. Ritchie's work focuses on the ways that race, ethnicity, and social position affect women's experience of violence and incarceration, focusing on the experiences of African-American battered women and sexual assault survivors. Dr. Ritchie is the author of many articles and at least two books, um, including her most recent, Arrested Justice, Black Women, Violence, and America's Prison Nation, which chronicles the evolution of the contemporary anti-violence movement during the time of mass incarceration in the United States. She's also written about black feminism and gender violence, race and criminal justice policy, and the social dynamics around issues of sexuality, prison abolition, and grassroots organizations in African American communities. And that barely scratches the surface. Uh, her work has been supported by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the National Institute for Justice, and the National Institute of Corrections. And this year, we are very fortunate that Dr. Ritchie became the head of UIC's Department of Criminology, Law, and Justice. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ritchie, and she will make the introductions of the other panelists. Good afternoon. And, um, Thank you, Provost Poser, for the opportunity to talk about the Me Too, Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. um, I like how, how it was framed. It says, what's going on mm -hmm. with the hashtag Me Too movement? I'm excited about having this conversation. Um, it's Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so the timing is, uh, is really good. It's also the 50th anniversary of the murder of Martin Luther King. Um, and since we're going to be talking about movements, it's important, I think, to lift, to lift that up um, as we move forward. Um, so these are esteemed colleagues from UIC and from the community, all of whom have some interest, uh, some concern, some experience, some research to share with us, um, some perspectives about sexual harassment as a form of gender-based violence, and the possibilities, and maybe even get into some of the limitations, of the hashtag uh, MeToo movement. Um, I'm going to start the framing of our discussion by going back to 1997. In 1997, Tara Tarara Burke, African American woman, was working with young girls and talking with a 13 year old black child, race and class and gender are important here, 13 year old black child. Uh, who was telling her about the horrific sexual abuse and exploitation that she was experiencing. Ms. Burke, who was overwhelmed by the story, as any of us uh, might and should be, 
uh, offers sympathetic advice, tries to connect this young child to resources, knowing at the time that the uh, connections, the resources, the services will probably be insufficient compared to the profound trauma and abuse that this young woman faced. And in terms of insufficient services, again, the race, class, and gender of this child is important. That was 1997, Tarana Burke. Uh, 10 years later, 2007, still haunted by the story that she heard from this 13-year-old girl, uh, but recognizing that the world around her by, nine, by year 2007 had changed. It had changed in terms of how we understand issues of harassment and gender violence. It changed in part because of the social movement that led to the changes in both public policy and in practice. Ms. Burke realized that what she wished she had done, what she should have done 10 years prior when the young woman was disclosing to her about the trauma that she experienced, Ms. Burke felt like what she should have done is said, me too. She went on to start an organization that focused on recovery and healing and self-disclosure with the explicit intention of decreasing isolation and stigma and shame that kept her as a service provider from saying to the young woman she was working with, me too. That organization is called Just Be You, and it's focused, again, with a race and class and gender lens to it. The organization is called Just Be You. And the central message of that organization uh, is that survivors should be able to disclose what has happened to them because strength will come from public uh, disclosure. And she's talking both about personal strength and about political strength. That was 2007. Fast forward to 2017. Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein is accused of profound and persistent sexual harassment by, I think, up to 80 women, including people like Ashley Judd. Ashley Judd was a friend of actress Alyssa Milano. Alyssa Milano, in support of her friend, writes a simple tweet 2017 that says, hashtag me too. Within 24 hours, over 12 million people, mostly women, had posted on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, talked about on the radio or on television, had said, me too. Most of them were white women, middle class women, employed women, employed in good jobs, heterosexual women, not physically challenged, who had relatively, relative to that 13-year-old girl, relatively little to lose by disclosing that they were like their white, middle-class, employed, heterosexual, well-positioned peers in having experienced sexual abuse or sexual harassment. It's important to remember the history, to maybe first learn about the history, but remember the history as we think about what's going on with the hashtag MeToo movement and why it's framed the way that it is and what we can do as we move forward. We're gonna talk about hashtag MeToo, but there's also hashtag times up, hashtag no more. And if we had the time to go back and explore where some of those hashtag movements, that's what I'm gonna call them, hashtag movements came from, I think we might find a similar history. That is, these get uh, produced as a certain kind of new public awareness that typically have strong historical roots in a kind of grassroots, often led by people who are not rich and famous set of experiences. Hashtag Me Too has spread across the country, indeed across the world. It is considered one of the most important movements, and we'll talk about what kind of movement, is it a justice movement, a social justice movement, is it a Twitter movement, what kind of movement is it? But it has indeed called attention to the issues of gender-based violence, particularly sexual harassment, where many women, millions of women, mostly women, have disclosed that they have been raped, assaulted, harassed, stalked, 
teased, humiliated, touched when they didn't want to be, intimidated, bullied, and denied promotions or fired, and forced into relationships in order to keep the position that they have, and coerced into not telling about their experience, silenced, isolated in their workplaces and homes, shamed by their peers, professional communities, etc. It is a movement of individual disclosure, for the most part, that is starting to ask questions about what the possibility of political organizing can be. I just want to make a few more kind of grounding points to get us forward. You know the history now if you didn't know it before. I use the term gender-based violence to sort of frame the larger uh, picture, if you will, of sexual harassment. And by that, I'm meaning the kind of targeted social, economic, psychological, and physical assaults toward people because of their gender or their perceived gender identity, the particular targeting. Sexual abuse and sexual assault is the sexual form of gender-based violence. So sexual harassment fits within the context of a larger set of issues or harms. Sexual harassment is the persistent unwanted attention that often brings either rewards or consequences. And a key link to understanding sexual harassment is the issue of consent. And I know we'll hear a little bit more about consent, I'm sure, from the panelists. For now, it's important to remember that the current thinking about consent is uh, the sense that people are involved willingly if they affirm their interest in pursuing whatever the interaction is going to be. So at one time, we thought about consent as you have no means no. Now we think of consent as yes means yes, right? that you have to affirm um, and a desire to be in an interaction in order for it to be consent. Um, we have some resources in the back for people who want to hear more about the specifics of sexual harassment. UIC, like most other institutions around the country, has seen a drastic increase in reporting of sexual harassment since the Me Too movement. I think that's one of the claims of success. We have people here from the Office of uh, Access and Equity, uh, who will, if you'll just wave your hand, stand up or something so we can see who you are, who will be available for resources, as I'm sure Natalie will also, for people who would like more information or some support. Two last points. Um, one thing the Me Too movement has shown us is how widespread the issue of sexual harassment is as one of the forms of gender violence. Um, it's not only understood now to be widespread, which again, many people, including people on this stage, have been working on this issue for over 20 years, 30 years. We've known it's been widespread. Now the world knows something about how widespread it is and that it's still significantly underreported. So the range in statistics say something like between one and three women will be sexually assaulted. Some statistics say as many as 70% of all women will be harassed in their work place or in their academic institution. We know that those numbers are underreported. At least 80% of assaults and harassment is not reported. So Me Too is trying to address that widespread nature and the underreported nature. It's also important, remembering the history, to uh, think about the linkages between this form of gender violence and other forms of gender violence and the particular ways that people in disadvantaged social positions suffer consequences that are worse. Or at least they're different. And so while the Me Too movement has called attention to kind of generalized, widespread, linked issue of gender abuse, we do want to, in our work, pay attention also to the specifics like the 13-year-old girl who was a black girl from a disadvantaged community as she disclosed what had happened to her to Ms. Burke, who was in many ways the founder of the Me Too movement. So we want to hold both the general experience as well as the specific experience that's often different depending on social location. Because that's what's going to, I think, move us from a set of discussions that looks at increased visibility 
to increase social justice, right? And that will change what the movement actually is. I'm going to take a seat now and invite the other panelists to come up and offer anything that they would like to share as framing remarks. And then I have a series of questions to get us going in the discussion, and then we'll open it up to you for your questions um, and suggestions, OK? Natalie? Yeah. Sure. Natalie Bennett. Oops. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Natalie Bennett, the director of the Women's Leadership and Resource Center and the Campus Advocacy Network. And I'm very happy to be part of this conversation today. One, because I've been feeling like it's necessary, but I certainly haven't had the chance or the kind of the space to kind of think about organizing it. So thank you to the provost for making this happen. Um, as usual, I lost my PowerPoint on the way, so I'm just gonna talk through this. Um, so part of what I want to say first is kind of talk to you, tell you a little bit about what the Campus Advocacy Network is. And I think that um, some of the comments that um, Dr. Ritchie has um, made kind of help to shape the, um, the framework for the program. So an important thing to know, which I recently kind of learned, is that the Campus Advocacy Program Network um, program came out of a grant from the federal government um, that was um, allo being allocated to different universities for providing services for uh, the language at the time was crime victims. We talk about them as survivors now. So the program itself came out of a very specific kind of federal set of directives that were also being shaped by um, the feminist um, and anti-violence movement that was really pushing for the state broadly, but also individual states, um, entities to actually find ways to both recognize as well as make visible um, the experiences of survivors, but also to actually do something about it. Um, so CAN's work has grown some, but there are ways in which it actually hasn't changed very much. Um, there are three major components to CAN's work on, at UIC. One is advocacy, doing individual advocacy with clients, um, uh, people who've experienced uh, different kinds of interpersonal violence. Almost all of it is gender-based violence, um, sexual assault, stalking, um, harassment, um, not as much sexual harassment, um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, then doing the crisis intervention work that's required. So that may require anything from getting on the phone and finding emergency housing, and usually we do that through campus housing, to finding food, to coming up with safety plans, that kind of intervention work. Engaging with faculty members um, with whom uh, or primarily, our clients are primarily students, and so kind of helping the, the students kind of get a little bit of breathing space to successfully complete their courses. We also do a lot of education work, and that education work um, certainly, I think, has been changing over the past year since I've been um, at Cannes. Uh, some of that work actually begun before, but moving the education around uh, violence from the kind of very particular individualized and more generalized understanding about violence and particularly gender-based violence to thinking about violence in this kind of broadly what we think about as an intersectional, having an intersectional analysis. So what does that look like? Um, that looks like uh, developing active collaborations with like the Disability Cultural Center, where largely we don't talk about uh, violence in anything except really ableist ways. And so bringing the kind of feminist critiques around violence, the strategies that have been developed in conversation with what the disability justice movement is doing, that's been a really, really powerful space to kind of do education with the campus. Uh, we also uh, co-sponsor and do collaborations with the other cultural centers. Again, really important points of um, cross-fertilization, if you will, um, both sharing resources but also expanding the ways in which we think about how violence operates in the lives of the students who are our clients. Um, a big chunk of our education work, of course, is prescribed by state law. And that is through the campus safe trainings that we do with 
um, fraternities and sororities, uh, do some work, not quite as much as I would like, with um, athletics, both the intramural as well as kind of um, the larger athletic system. Um, we also do uh, work with a lot of campus, a lot of student groups. So that involves doing projects and um, workshops around uh, bystander intervention. That's actually become, it's getting to be probably one of our larger and more successful prog programs, excuse me, because people actually want it. They don't just want to be able to report what happened. They actually want to be able to try to figure out how to do something to prevent what's happened, uh, to prevent something from happening. Another piece of the education um, is increasingly around uh, thinking about like restorative justice. So the way that we've started to do that work is actually in partnership with community organizations in Chicago. So uh, we've worked with Love and Protect, for example, to do to bring awareness to uh, the Free Brucia Meadows campaign, the Kai Peterson campaign, and we use our, in, our involvement in those campaigns as a way to help. UIC folks here kind of understand that violence is not this kind of individual, personal experience. It really is related to how people are located within the larger structures. And so we use those campaigns as a way to do that education work. In terms of who Ken's uh, clients are, so I'm brand new to this position. I still feel like I can say that. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted to know when I started working with CAN uh, was like who, who uses the services of CAN? And after kind of digging around, I took a look at the data from 2008 to 2017. Um, and what I found was actually, it was interesting. Uh, one, yes, the majority of our clients are women, uh, mostly cisgendered women, but some trans women. Um, all racial groups, racial categories um, are involved, but interestingly, the two largest categories are white women and Asian women, Asian women actually being the largest category. So that is very, very interesting to me. Um, in also among men, the men who are our clients, uh, the largest category of men that we seem to serve is our Asian men. So again, there's something going on there that I need to kind of dig deeper into. Um, Traditional college years, uh, 18 to 24, that's kind of who we tend to see. Our largest category of, um, in terms of what brings people to, to can, domestic violence. And domestic violence, uh, not, just between, not just between intimate partners, but actually between parents and children, um, between um, siblings, and so again, or framework, the framework that has been used to kind of talk about domestic violence in this very kind of general way really doesn't speak to who actually actually needs our services. So that's something that we need to kind of speak to. Um, the other larger cat next largest category um, is sexual assault. The majority of the work that we do then is both crisis intervention, coming up with safety plans, housing, doing survivor advocacy. So one of the other things that I recently kind of started to uh, wrap my head around, and this speaks very directly to Beth's um, kind of insistence that we start to think in more kind of critical um, ways about who is experiencing violence and why. Whenever someone comes, whenever a client comes to CAN, it is almost a guarantee, I realize, that they have touched multiple points in the university already, as well as outside of the university. They've been in touch with homeless, um, with housing agencies around homelessness. They've been in touch with food, um, with the food pantry. Uh, they are trying to figure out employment issues, how to not only pay their tuition, but also literally pay their rent and their housing expenses. So there are a lot of things that are kind of, the way that we think about uh, traditional college age, um, I think, Many of us still have that idea that, that that's who is here. But when we start to pay attention to the fact that many of our students are actually commuter students, that actually means something in terms of how they experience the violence, how they're going to respond to it, and what we need to be able to do here at the university. As I said earlier, um, when the beginning of the 
the kind of the Me Too, what happened? Oh, okay, I did something? <laughs> All right, maybe I'll close it, okay. Um, so at the beginning of the Me Too campaign, one of the things that we decided to do um, in, through CAN as a way to, um, to begin a conversation was to do a kind of, to read that very, very controversial text, everybody should know it, um, on that by Laura Kipnis. And we had a really robust conversation about what it means to talk about sexual harassment in the academy. In the national media, the conversation about sexual harassment in the academy um, focuses largely on these like, um, I call them like serial harassers. Um, specific cases where there are like multiple individuals um, who have been assaulted by, often was a faculty member, um, and then there was some kind of internal, problematic internal process where nothing was ever done, right? So a lot of the conversation is around people who are already have formal jobs, often um, postdoctoral and graduate students um, and faculty. But as we started to kind of think about what the, where we are at, at UIC and Chicago, it started to become clear, I think, like who is not in this conversation at all, who is not participating, who we're not even talking about because we're talking about sexual harassment in these very general ways. One is specifically graduate students, right? So thinking about graduate students as students, as workers, as members of communities, but also who, many of whom will go on to become part of the professorate. And so what are the conversations that we need to be having about how they can be agents of change in the spaces that they are, but also how to recognize and record and listen to and hear what, is ex what they're experiencing in this institution and doing something about it. Similarly, postdoctoral fellows are another what I think about as, um, as uh, a category of folks, many of whom are, are not white, um, largely immigrant, uh, who are also not part of these conversations around sexual harassment in the academy. So if we're gonna think about social location, then um, we need to pay attention to that. Um, the other categories, and I'll close here actually, are pre-tenure and contingent faculty. We have no discussions about adjunct faculty because we're gonna presume that, I don't know, they're disposable, they don't exist, they don't matter, I don't know. Um, auxiliary staff, the people who literally make this place possible. People who provide our food, who clean the floors, who schlep our paper and our garbage, et cetera. They are not, they have not been part of the conversations about the sexual harassment in the academy, and I think we need to pay some more attention to that. And finally, of course, uh, students of color. Even though they are the largest category of um, clients for CAN, um, in the national conversation, and certainly here, we don't really see any particular discussions about what it means for students of color to experience sexual violence on top of the other kinds of social stressors that they're experiencing in the academy. So thank you. Good afternoon. See, I'm a, I'm a community member, so I've got to be a good afternoon. Um, <laughs> so I, um, this was wonderful. This is amazing to be on this panel. I'm normally like on the audience, looking and witnessing uh, Beth's brilliance, and so I'm so honored to be part of this. And then Natalie and I often collaborate um, for many things. We have two events, I think, within this next week together. Um, so hopefully we talk about it. And Paul, I'm just honored to like meet you and be part of this, um, this talk today. Um, and so um, I wanted to really talk about, well, obviously me too, but um, as a person who's dedicated their whole life uh, to end violence against women and girls, and what this particular moment means right now, and to be honored to be uh, alive, really, and, and see things that you didn't even dream could happen, right? So, like you all, that day that 
Alyssa Milano um, tweeted the words Me Too from Toronto's, um, t from Toronto's uh, movement, Me Too. I remember witnessing and seeing like hundreds of my friends, and including me, write the words Me Too, right? Um, and that's the, of the 12 million people that Beth uh, witnessed, um, was talking about who were impacted by Me Too. In Toronto yesterday, um, I was at a talk with her yesterday, and she reminded us that those 12 million people are people, mm -hmm. right? They all are our stories. They all have some history, and we shouldn't take that lightly. Like that many people that first day uttered the words Me Too for the first time and disclosing and saying it publicly for the first time. At the same time that day on Facebook, I got to see Tarana's holding the movement, making sure that her leadership, her creativity wasn't going to be erased because she was a black woman, right? And on all these people galvanizing in terms of um, different women of color galvanizing, making sure that that the Me Too hashtag was going to be associated with Toronto, despite um, the turns of events um, in Hollywood, right? And how they both could use that power to make something even bigger and something larger. I remember seeing people post the original video of Toronto's speech 10 years ago. Um, and so seeing all of that at the same time was pretty uh, amazing, emotional moment to be part of. Um, and so I wanted to just really talk about, really like use my, my delicate time right now to really talk about um, how we got here. Um, and Beth did such a great job of that, so I'm just gonna like add to that, which is wonderful. Um, and the long histories of, of what, the layers of work, right? So we could just see that Me Too came out of like left field for some people, right? But it's endless, long work um, and so I created this collage, which you guys are all like um, got to uh, when you guys came here. Um, and so I'm just going to highlight a couple people because I think, like Toronto, holding on to her leadership, I want to center the voices of women of color's leadership um, who have allowed us to be at this point to talk about Me Too and to see and imagine where we're going to be and create, as we are at this powerful movement, what it could look like, what are the possibilities of this movement. So I'm going to begin um, with it because it is the anniversary of MLK, but Rosa Parks. Um, I remember beginning with Rosa Parks um, being a survivor herself of attempted rape by her, um, what was her white neighbor, um, who also employed her at the age of 18. Um, and so and that was 1931. And so a lot of us know Rosa Parks, obviously, for her, in, in, like, her movement in the civil rights, but her thinking about her also saying Me Too. Um, her also then going on to organize at the NAACP different black women's um, stories, and black women and girls' stories who also were violated against sexual assault, right? So taking her personal narrative in, um, from 1931, I believe that then impacted 1994 um, and her leadership work with black women. I also wanna highlight the founders in the anti-violence movement, I think Beth, I, I attribute you to uh, this work um, with Loretta Ross and so many others that we have to mention um, but don't have time to mention. But like also not only being the founders of the anti-violence movement, but forcing us to look at this intersectionally, right? With the criminal justice work, with reproductive work, right? And so like looking very early on at how this is not just a singular lens, right? Um, attributing Anita Hill, right? 1992, change all of our lives of how we look at sexual harassment. Laws, empowering women to come forward for the first time about this. Um, also going to um, government roles uh, in, uh, that shifted everything. Um, and then we're gonna fast forward just because I would love to be here and just really talk about this. Um, but I wanna mention Aisha Simmons, um, a no rape documentary, um, a, a film that I had the be part of, but a rape uh, documentary about black women's stories of rape. Um, and then, um, I, Black Lives Matter changed everything. I just want to put that out there. It has changed everything. It changed not only the power of a hashtag, but it changed how individual people are now seeing themselves as activists, coming into the streets and shifting everything. And I think that has impacted um, the Women's March 
um, and the women's rights movement today, right? And that how that impacted me too. And I also want to say, and I was I remember being at this moment in time, seeing Black Lives Matter happening, and seeing the efforts on college campuses around sexual uh, assault. And I was uh, and all the college students um, galvanizing and organizing about Title IX. Um, and I was wondering, I, I would talk about this. What if those two movements were talking to each other, right? If you had this amazing college, you know, Emma, and I, I put her, her her photo there. She was carrying. Um, her dorm room mattress for a year until graduation as a way of creating awareness, um, and reminding people that she was sexually assaulted and getting justice in a way that her, the college, her college system failed her, right? But imagine if Black Lives Matter and the college sexual assault, which were at the heights, were talking to each other at the same time. And I think this is where we are now and we could possibly be. Um, and so we are witnessing Lupita to Simone Biles saying me too. We're witnessing men and women doing their own self-reflections about sexual harassment and sexual violence for the first time. So I'm going to now talk about my work and how I got here. So that's the framing and I want us to think about. Um, so I began this work, and I always say this, I began this work as a college student. I was a sophomore in college, and my sister um, just graduated from Penn, um, and we, she told me for the first time that she was a sexual assault survivor. In that moment, and not only once, she was sexually assaulted twice in college. Um, and I was the first family member that she ever told, and I did not know what to do, right? As a sophomore in college, as a younger sister. Um, and what I end up doing is I turned to my art photography. Um, and I asked her um, if I could document her healing process. So this is a very early picture. I mean, I wish I had a better face in this picture. Uh, <laughs> but it's a very early on. Um, of us uh, going on this journey and not knowing. And I gotta say, this was 1998, so there's very few models of black women's stories of sexual assaults um, in terms of visual representations, at least. But there was very few models of looking at healing, right? Um, and so I had to look at cancer survivors and um, work with HIV to like learn how to, how to do the photography um, about it. Um, so I documented her story. Uh, from 98 and so we could say to a couple of years ago even. Um, and this year, um, we celebrate our 20th year anniversary of, of this SOARS performance. Um, it was what, what the photographs became later into a larger SOARS performance. Um, and so this is one of the photos in it very early on. And this is from Aisha's film, who I mentioned about No, the Rape Documentary. So different photographs, it's 19, 2009. And so me and Salamisha together um, decided to transform those photographs for the public um, because I remember showing that in, in that initial class, um, uh, I took a class in photography and I showed uh, my, my class and so many other survivors in that class really said me too, right? Without saying the word me too. Um, and my teacher was like, you need to show this to other people. So I made it to my senior project, and so this is what you're seeing here. And I really want to stress that I, we were college students because I think we see these things and we don't see that like you have the power to do things, right? Um, I knew what I did, which was photography and the arts. We all have something, right? Um, and then we transformed this into a multimedia performance. I also want to say that um, if it wasn't for the Women's Center at my college campus, I don't think my organization would exist. Mm -hmm. It was the belief that I went to the Women's Center for one of those things that you mentioned, Natalie, um, for resources as a secondary victim. And it was there that the Women's Center, um, and I said, I'm doing this project, can I get support for it? And at the time, you're right, the same grants that you guys probably received was happening. and. Um, the Women's Center not only helped support me emotionally and financially with my senior project, but then emailed all her colleagues about our source performance, and then that's how we started um, our nonprofit, A Long Walk Home. And we toured this, this performance with dancers, so people would dance in front of my photographs and 
a singer and a poet, and we've toured it to like over 100, or th actually 300 different universities today, um, and using the model of using narratives and storytelling to tell one story about sexual violence and, and the healing. So push back, we're going down, down the line. Okay, okay, time. Okay, I'm gonna do two more, two more. Okay, I'm gonna go really quickly though. So I really wanna talk about the girls that inspired Tarana's project, the Me Too, that black girl, that 13 year old. Um, and so I think those are the girls that I work with now. So as we're on this journey, me and my sister have done SOARS, we decided to do a program here in Chicago called Gorfman's Leadership Institute, where we use art as a way to talk about gender violence and also racial justice. Um, and so we give those girls, I'm gonna go fast, we give them cameras to tell their own stories um, about what, and these are like, what if you had just told your story? So this, these particular series are about um, uh, gender-based violence. And to support them by simply saying, me too, like by telling them our own stories, you're, you're gonna get um, these images. And what happens to these images, we then put them in exhibitions, we, we transform them, we put them into protests, they become our signs um, to also represent other young girls and women. Um, and I wanna end with this story about this march because I think it could be solutions to what we are trying to go to. So our young girls did a march in their neighborhood where they go to school, they have two different campuses um, in North Lawndale, and they're experiencing a lot of street harassment from one campus to another campus. And so 20 of them galvanized and marched, and they customized their shirts, hey, not my baby, each one is different, um, and marched in their community with also young boys who wore shirts, customized, I'm not a harasser, to show their support. Um, and then this march then became bigger, like the next year we decided to do this march because of the stories we heard, we decided to do this march uh, Instead of in the streets, we did it in the halls, right? Because the stories that they were telling um, us were being uh, sexually harassed by their, their peers and people telling official people, um, faculty members and them not responding in the correct way, but they also were being harassed by faculty members as well. So we decided to take the same march and take it to the streets. The next year after, we then got to do professional development with the staff and students, and one of our girls even got a faculty member fired um, who had a very positional, who had a very important uh, position due to the uh, sexual harassment that he was doing to the young girls. And so I say this, okay, so I'll end with this one. Um, oh, I'll end with this one. <laughs> um, I say that, that our young girls are also being part of the solution. I also, um, with this image, I also want to force us to think about how we are the crossroads of different movements right now and how they all can be speaking to each other, whether it's the gun violence and how gun violence impacts gender-based violence, how Black Lives Matter is part of Me Too. Um, so I'm gonna end there. Thanks. Hey, I'm, I'm Paul Shuey from the Criminology Law and Justice Department. Uh, it's a little refreshing having the uh, middle-aged white man last on the list, right? Um, and, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's great and appropriate, and it, and it kind of models uh, maybe how, how I approach uh, sexual assault, sexual assault prevention, is I, I, I like to, to listen to women um, and, and speak to men. Um, uh, so uh, that being said, we're talking about uh, Me Too here. Um, I think uh, the Me Too movement is, is uh, the most exciting uh, uh, thing that's happened in the world of sexual assault prevention uh, since the beginning. I've been doing uh, this research since uh, 1992 um, and I think forever forward, we're gonna talk about before and after uh, the Me Too movement. Um, I certainly, you know, it's, it's a game changer, kind of like 9-11, how we talk about the world pre and post 9-11. Uh, um, and it, it, and uh, the, the, the scary thing to put that in perspective for us is the students I have in my classroom today have very little awareness of life pre 9-11. Uh, just, uh, anyway, so, so, so things change. Uh, in the sexual assault prevention movement, uh, at times I'm I'm super excited. I'm like, wow, we have come so far, uh, you know, since the 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 70s and 80s. 
and then and then the next day I'll think, oh my gosh, have we, it, we we've gone nowhere <laughs> since uh, the 70s and 80s, and what's all this research we're doing, and you know what's the impact we're having, um, and and the Me Too movement has really made me change my perspective. I've always been a little, you know, uh, 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 um, awareness raising campaigns um, really don't change behavior. They you, you know, and and when we're talking about sexual harassment, sexual assault prevention, we want to change behavior. Um, we, we've all been aware of the, uh, of the, the problem, uh, you know, forever. You know, we, we mentioned some of these incidents, you know, the, 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 the Catholic Church, you know, uh, uh, sexual uh, abuse scandal, you know, uh, you know, that was huge news. Did anything really change after that? No. Um, you know, we've got Anita Hill and Bill Cosby and, and you know, just uh, uh, scandals in the military and, and I mean, it's, it, it's been in our awareness for a while. Um, I'm not sure, you know, so, so the Me Too movement has uh, uh, um, given me new interest in uh, the power of media and social media. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's very exciting. All right, we're, we're gonna, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where I'm coming from We'll go back and talk about the, uh, the Me Too movement and some of the, the controversies and the back, backlash. Um, I, think, I think that's uh, th those, those difficult topics are the ones we have to hit head on because that's what's being talked about um, in the dorms and on campus and uh, you know, in, in the private spaces. Um, uh, and, then, and then I want to finish up on talking about, well, what's our, what's our path forward? Um, so a, a little bit about me. So I'm uh, uh, strictly about stopping men from uh, committing sexual assault. Uh, uh, like I said, I, I, I listen to, to victims and female uh, uh, colleagues. That's where I get my source of information. Um, but the problem of sexual assault and se sexual harassment, it's not a woman's issue. It's a men's issue. Um, uh, so I, I, I uh, start out my, I'm a, I'm a reformed uh, clinical psychologist. Um, <laughs> So, uh, in, in my first couple of years as a, as a clinical psych grad student, seeing clients, you know, when 80% of your female clients have a history of sexual assault or child sexual abuse, um, it doesn't take long to say, you know, the only real solution to this is stopping it in the first place. Um, it's so much work uh, to rebuild um, trust and, and healing um, in, in, in the lives of a survivor that, that pr primary prevention is really the only way to go. So I, 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 I uh, tried creating some uh, sexual assault prevention programs for college men uh, back in the, the early 90s. Um, and, then, uh, and then later on, uh, it, you know, kind of quickly learned that, that college is probably too late. Mm -hmm. Started working with uh, high schools and the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault, um, uh, looking at, you know, what can we do to change uh, the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors of our, our high school students. Um, across the high school years, high school freshmen change way more than, than high school uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors when exposed to sexual assault prevention uh, education. So I'm like, well, maybe high school is too late. Uh, started working in, in middle schools around uh, teen dating violence. Um, so many of kids' earliest dating relationships are marked by uh, by violence, abuse, humiliation, uh, jealousy, um, and you know, and getting getting those earliest relationships right uh, is really important. Um, and so we have to move, you know, so moved earlier and looked at at sexual harassment and and social emotional um, intelligence in our young people. You know, how do we give them the tools to form uh, healthy, respectful relationships? Um, in those in those earliest uh, you know elementary school years, um, and even then, uh, certainly kids uh, uh, experience a horrific amount of violence even in their earliest years. Um, so you know, kids zero to five when they're growing up in homes where there's uh, when there's domestic violence, um, those kids are at kind of you know serious risk, um, you know, for uh, uh, experiencing you know lots of heartbreak and. And, and violence in their future relationships. So some of my biggest projects now um, involve, uh, you know, figuring out what we can do for kids zero to five that are growing up in homes where there's violence. 
And then coming f full circle, uh, uh, I'm also doing a lot of work in the, in the military. The military's, uh, uh, they're the only ones with money um, that are trying to address the sexual, the, the sexual assault problem. Um, so some, doing some work uh, back with, with them. I think parent education is a, is a big thing too. Um, so, uh, um, so what consequence do I think the Me Too movement has had, is gonna have? Uh, my sincere hope, so, so uh, post Me Too, uh, I think men across the country, uh, we've been examining our own behavior. And man, have, have, have I ever hurt someone? Have I ever you know, uh, 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 crossed, crossed any lines? And, and I think that's fantastic. I think there's a lot of fears among, uh, among men saying, oh my gosh, you know, uh, you know what, do I do, what do I do now? Uh, this is kind of, you know, kind of scary. I don't know how to operate in this, in this new world where women are empowered and I just can't get away with the same old shit I've been getting away with uh, uh, for years. And, and the answer to that is, well, you need to treat humans like humans, uh, you know, have respectful relationships and, and, and you're, not gonna, uh, you're not gonna have to worry about it. Um, uh, the, the other, uh, I think, great thing, um, one, one thing we learned early on in, in that uh, uh, working with uh, high schools in sexual assault prevention programming is that uh, you know, treating young people as either potential uh, victims of sexual assault or potential perpetrators of sexual assault is completely ineffective. Uh, they're going to tune you out. Uh, high school is one of those most wonderful times in our lives uh, where we're invincible. <laughs> no, no young boy thinks he's ever going to perpetrate sexual assault. No, no young girl ever thinks she's going to be a victim of, of sexual assault. Um, and, and that's why the, the promise of the bystander movement really is important. It, it gives space for everybody at the table. Um, and, and, and now it, we've been saying it for years, you know, one in four, one in three, um, you know, women is going to uh, experience sexual assault in their lifetimes. One in seven, one in nine uh, men and boys are going to experience sexual assault in their lifetime. You, we all know people who've been uh, uh, sexually assaulted. My, my grandfather uh, sexually assaulted several of my uh, sisters and cousins. Uh, my daughter, uh, when she was on a study abroad program in Japan, uh, was sexually assaulted. Um, if that you know if that doesn't hurt hurt a sexual assault prevention researcher uh, you know I don't I don't know what does um, we've all been touched um, um, you know by this uh, by this issue the bystander intervention program says you know y you'll never uh, perpetrate sexual you, you may never perpetrate you know sexual assault uh, you may never be the victim of sexual assault but at some point in your life someone you know and love will be uh, whether it's your daughter your sister your girlfriend, your wife, um, your mother, you're gonna wanna know what you can do uh, to help them, um, but more importantly, you're gonna wanna uh, uh, take a stand in preventing this from ever happening in the first place. Um, so so while, while treating uh, young people as potential perpetrators um, it isn't ineffective, you know, so one of the early constructs we said, well, you know, sexual assault is a, is a a, a low risk behavior. It's not reported. Uh, when it is, it's rarely uh, you know, prosecuted, and when it's prosecuted, it's rarely convicted. It's, it, it's the one crime you can commit and get away with, um, especially if there's alcohol involved, especially if it's someone who knows you and trusts you. That's a scary situation, right? Uh, the, the, the criminal justice uh, system um, has no good answer for, for violence in relationships for child abuse, for domestic violence, uh, for sexual assault. Um, we need to come up with, uh, with, um, with other solutions. Uh, the nice thing about the Me Too movement, so, so uh, if, if, if we told our young men, hey, you can't commit sexual assault, you know, you, you, know, you could go to jail, uh, you're gonna get a bad reputation, you'll get, you know, people know you as a sexually aggressive guy and you'll never get another date. Um, it's, it's lying to them and lying to people never works. Um, but now with the Me Too movement, um, you, you know, victims are getting a voice. And so, it, you know, maybe, it, so telling kids there could be consequences is ineffective. I think the Me Too movement has maybe showed, has shown a generation of men that there is gonna, you are gonna be, get called out for your, for your bad behavior. Um, and so be respectful, 
so I'm, 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 I'm hopeful of that, um, that the Me Too movement is providing some consequences for, for men, um, that it'll embolden bystanders to speak out when, uh, again, sexist behavior, language, all that kind of, uh, you know, uh, that gray area, that low level, uh, uh, sexually inappropriate uh, behavior that men have been getting away with for years and years and years, um, hopefully their male and female friends are gonna be um, emboldened to call them out um, on that and, and make a dent into, uh, into rape culture. Um, I'm excited that, uh, that in the Me Too movement, uh, men have been speaking out about their uh, sexual victimization um, uh, uh, experiences. And, and, and in fact, uh, uh, just sitting here, I was reminded that as a, as a, as a freshman in high school, um, I answered a, a, a work ad uh, did some drywall work and, and remodeling work for for a guy who uh, uh, a married man who who propositioned me uh, as a 13 year old boy. Uh, I never thought about that until just now. So I, I think a, a, a lot more men probably have had uh, you know encounters with uh, uh, inappropriate uh, uh, behavior by other men um, uh, by and large. Um, so I'm I'm excited. Uh, uh, I'm hoping you know. The, the, uh, um, as far as the backlash thing, maybe we'll have some more questions uh, about that later. I need to wrap things up here. But, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the pendulum is, is, is swinging and, and men have always been in a position of power and kind of impunity. Um, and now, yeah, you, you know, so if we think of some of those highly publicized events, uh, Garrison Keillor comes to mind, mm -hmm. um, other people, and Ziz Ansari, that, that sparked a lot of uh, uh, conversations, right? Um, you know, if, 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 the, if the pendulum swings in the other direction and men, and, 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 and men are, are uh, accused or, their, or professions are destroyed um, over, you know, relatively minor infractions, I mean, you know, we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to deal with that uh, uh, for a while, you know, I think we can, I think we in the movement can handle it. Mm -hmm. We need to address it head on um, and not let the backlash overshadow the, the tremendous forward movement that's been made. Well, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you all to turn your mics on now. Well, so I wanted each one of you to go on forever um, because you raised so many important points and I'm often, this is often the moment when you're moderating where you say it's so, complicated, and usually complicated means like this is going badly. <laughs> but in fact, at this moment, I feel like it is so complicated and I feel so optimistic. And that's a really different feeling for me, at, you know, in general, but also specifically around this issue. So I wanna pick up on a couple of themes and also respond to some of you who've uh, given us questions. Thank you for those. This is a good time to take the pencil out if you have it and write a question down on the index card. I'm gonna to try to integrate some of your questions into some of the things that the panelists uh, have already talked about. Um, so we have the long story now. That's really good. I appreciate the history. I also appreciate sort of each of your intervention, both as the service provider on campus, I know you're much more than that, as the artist who <laughs> has really sort of done the work on the ground, um, you're much more than that too, and, and my colleague Paul from Criminology, Law and Justice is sort of modeling what this behavior uh, and the research and the activism needs to look like, appreciating all of you. A um, Couple of things, one, I am curious if you, about whether you think, um, well, well, let me put it differently. So the Me Too movement has brought us some things, uh, it's cost us some things too. And one of the questions from the audience is about the negative consequences, uh, maybe the unforeseen negative consequences. We could call it backlash. What uh, do we need to do in terms of course correction with the Me Too, move, Me Too movement in order for it to reach the potential that you left us feeling so optimistic about, Paul? And, and specifically, the questions about what does it mean to have a kind of high profile 
um, gender essential, like all the sisters are together as if we're all equal image of the Me Too movement. Although Ms. Burke's picture was on your initial um, oh, yeah, collage, thank that, you. Yeah. What, what are the risks of that? And then also, what are the potential risks of um, over-criminalizing, over-reporting stigma to people who um, really aren't involved in illegal or unethical behavior? Um, and what is, that, what is the potential of backlash for that, right? Um, does anybody want to start? I mean, Paul, you, you know, started just, with it, yeah. Just, uh, 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 one thing, yeah, I, I think it's really important in this is, is to distinguish between, between criminal behavior and, and inappropriate behavior, um, you know, on, on, on the one hand, um, and that'll help, you know, with, uh, and, and you have to forgive me, I'm not a pop culture person. I've had to become one since uh, October of last fall. Um, but the, the whole uh, 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 Enzi Zansari um, thing, I mean, she, she wasn't reporting sexual assault. She never intended to that. She never said she did that. Mm -hmm. But then so many people in, in, in who, you know, we all love Enzi Zansari. He's funny mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, he's, he's, he's done some good things in his career. Uh, you know, there was backlash against her. You know, who is she to, to destroy this guy over a bad date? Well, you know, uh, she, 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 was, she was reporting a bad date, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's okay, and, 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 and guys should be called out on their, on their bad behavior. That being said, all of us have multiple conflicting identities. Um, none of us want to be held for one, uh, you know, uh, one uh, incidence of, ba of bad behavior, uh, you know, mm. none of us wants our, our careers, you know, our relationships destroyed uh, over that. Um, uh, you know, we talk about that a lot with, with uh, 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 gang research. One of our colleagues, John Hagedorn, you know, he always talks about multiple conflicting identities. Gang member, you know, we have an image of, the media has framed gang members in a certain way, uh, you know, like terrorists. <laughs> No redeeming qualities, right? Well, yeah, they can be great partners. They can be loving, loving uh, husbands, loving fathers, uh, providers. Uh, we all have multiple conflicting identities, um, and 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 so uh, yeah, we just need mm -hmm. you know need to recognize that there's been you know in history some mm -hmm. of the the you know positive forces of change uh, in in history, you know. They've got skeletons in their closet. They've done some awful things. Does that negate the positive things they do? No. Mm -hmm. We all have good and evil exists in all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's part of the point I was making about that it's complicated, because that answer brings up questions about mm -hmm. change, redemption, mm -hmm. possibility of growth, mm -hmm. uh, what apology and accountability might look like, and whether there's a way to say, yes, it happened to me too, and I also did these things to other people, and so they're me tooing me, you know? And so how do we keep it not sort of a, a bright line, but a, but a clear line that is uh, permeable somehow, right? Any of, either of the two of you want to add anything to this question about backlash or redemption or change? Um, I have a couple thoughts about that, and I've gone kind of all over the place um, for the past several months. Um, I should mention that we just, uh, myself and a group from Interference Archives in New York, just finished installing an exhibition here, which you all should go see, um, called Take Back the Fight, uh, Resisting mm -hmm. Sexual Violence from the Ground Up. And in the process of kind of going through the materials and um, deciding the kind of order and how we wanted to organize them. Part of what became very clear to me um, was that the problem with Me Too is that there's no movement. That people are connected through the stories that we're telling, but there's no way to kind of formally organize to make certain kinds of things happen, mm -hmm. right? So as I'm looking in the exhibition and um, looking at all the kinds of material that 
women and queer folks were creating to not only educate, but also to actively push back about what it meant to be a survivor, right? Creating resources for each other, making demands of communities, um, pushing back on the state, the ways in which the state, um, the kind of insistence on criminalization of of perpetrators and saying, well, you know what? That's not necessarily justice. In fact, one of the, like, the best sides, like you say call the police, you say police, we say police brutality, mm -hmm. right? So to kind of recognize the ways in which criminalization of perpetrators actually produces a whole other level of violence yes. that actually comes back often to the person who was initially violated. Right. Um, so thinking in a much more kind of I don't know if holistic is the word I want to use, but maybe that's what it is, about how we repair harm, what is the harm that is done, and calling people to account for what they right. did. Right. So having a faculty member fired, sometimes that really is the best thing, but it's not always like the thing that needs to happen immediately, because it doesn't actually repair what has happened to everybody who that person has touched. Right. right. So, um, so those are just some of the things I've yeah. been thinking. Thank you for um, bringing that uh, question up because one of the other questions that's linked to this is about structural solutions. Mm -hmm. And you know, clearly what I think Me Too has offered us is the possibility of um, healing and health and change, real social change, mm -hmm. because of personal mm -hmm. disclosure. Mm -hmm and sort of the politics around saying me too and aligning oneself, right, therefore mm -hmm. with a set of experiences. Mm -hmm. What it doesn't do is talk about what structural changes, mm -hmm. I think Paul, you alluded to this, what mm -hmm. structural changes need to happen so that there is a movement of people, yeah, that never happened to me because the following things changed in my family or in my school mm -hmm. or in my community or in, our policies, right? And so the, the limits, if we can name, if we can name mm -hmm. them, is that the politics of self-disclosure doesn't necessarily, necessarily translate into structural mm -hmm. and political change. Mm -hmm. The question, I think, is how is that possible and, and how might that be possible? I mean, it's, that's a question for everybody, not just for, mm -hmm. uh, not just for the panelists. Mm -hmm. which you can answer or not answer. Because I, 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 I have more. Yeah. I have more. Yeah. I have more. No. Yeah. Well, how, the question is, how does it lead to structural? Yeah, does it lead to structural change? <laughs> what would possible? be the next step? Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Is, is Me Too the best? And, and is Me Too the best way for that to happen? Were you going to speak to that? Hmm. I mean, I think. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, about it, but I do want to say one thing. I do think it is a movement, so I do. Well, think, is that yes? Yeah, yeah. I was like, Can I, you I, say I, what kind? What? It, what I mean, why I what kind of movement? movement? I right. do think like the feminists, like we begin with the individual and then it grows mm -hmm. into, uh, the, you know, the political mm -hmm. begins with self and then goes outwards. So I think the fact that we're still speaking about it in April, it began in October. Mm -hmm. Like the longevity, like did we think this hashtag, like that day that would end up us uh, still talking about it and then also creating, I think a lo I think the thing is aligning it with the things that we actually want it to look like, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I, uh, to, to talk a little bit about like, I think I began, why I began with that, it, the images of those different narratives is because I think one of the things that, as we saw Chawana fight for her place so much, mm -hmm. like how does this movement end up eventually being talked like where my girls are benefiting from it mm -hmm. in terms of the resources, in terms of their healing, like what needs to be provided for the original intent of Me Too for that 13 year old girl, um, how does it, how do we get it to be talking about her still mm -hmm. as it has gone and using mm -hmm. the power that has happened with Hollywood and artists and activists um, go to globes and how, how does it end up being talked about to my young girl um, mm -hmm. who resides in North Lawndale, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I ended with this and I like wanted to just quickly talk about that because I don't know if that like gets to your question about the structural. Mm -hmm. Because I ended with this because 
this is a march that we did for Vakia Boyd, right, um, who was killed due to gun violence, um, you know, two miles away from here. And many people know Vakia because of the activism in, in Chicago and nationally he helped her. Um, but that young boy, oh, hello, okay, sorry. The young boy, He's gonna hold it. Yeah. Okay, the young boy is holding the photograph of my sister um, in the Rikia Boyd march. Um, and so I think, and I don't know if this really answers your question, I That's hope okay. it does, but um, there is something really like amazing for this young boy to choose that sign to march, and that we put it in there, like, you know, you could choose any of these signs, but this young boy who actually ended up joining the march too, right? Um, so for a march that was about state violence and gun violence and aligning it with a photograph that was really about healing, it says courage to heal. And it was, for us, it's a, it's a photograph about sexual violence, right? Um, and so I think in order to eventually get to our girls, like we, had, we have to like think about these, mo these movements intersectionally. Like we have to start connecting the young people marching in DC mm -hmm. and how much narrative around community violence in Chicago that exists to gender-based violence, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I, for me, that's how I think we're yeah. gonna get to yeah. it is by yeah. like looking at class, mm -hmm. looking at multiple forms of violences and, and changing the narrative to eventually be able to talk about young girl that Me Too was, was invented for. Right. So and, then, and, okay, and, go ahead. And, uh, I'm, 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 I'm much more uh, uh, optimistic about how this will uh, result in, in real organizational structural uh, changes. Um, so I, I, mm -hmm. I, I draw on this, the social ecological model um, mm -hmm. for changing mm -hmm. kind of public health issues. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, that just that. suggests that, you know, there's individuals, mm -hmm. Um, are embedded in relationships, are embedded in communities and organizations, mm -hmm. and these are embedded in the larger, larger society. So if, if we want to change anything, we need to, you know, we need to educate in, in, individuals, which is primarily what we rely on, and that's not sufficient. Uh, we also need to change those, those relationships in which those uh, individuals exist. So mm -hmm. that maybe get, gives us our bystander kind of intervention sort of stuff, mm -hmm. parent education, um, getting, our, getting our parents talking to young people about, about sex and violence and respect. Um, and then we've got our, our organizations, our schools, our, our criminal justice system, our child protection system, mm -hmm. uh, our, our churches, our Boy Scouts, our, our sports uh, teams. Those are all organizations uh, that have an impact on, 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 uh, on, our, on every aspect of our lives. And, but then all of these are embedded in, in uh, the culture. And, and, and I think the, the Me Too movement um, has impacted uh, our, our culture. I think it's a cultural yes, change. Cultural and, and the cultural change gives meaning to all those other levels. Mm. So now when, when, when UIC sits down to think about, okay, how are we gonna address allegations of sexual uh, harassment on campus, um, you know, where, where pr it, it's not, primarily student to student, it's primarily faculty and student. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's students against their grad student TAs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, you know, it's really multifaceted uh, uh, as, mm -hmm. as you talked, talked about, but, but you know, how UIC responds to that in the future will be influenced mm -hmm. by this mm -hmm. larger mm -hmm. cultural change. Mm -hmm. How schools respond to, you know, um, mm -hmm. hopefully as parents will no longer say, oh, boys will be boys, um, you know, Hope that that's that's been a cultural staple in our society forever, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that will uh, will start to this cultural change is going to impact all the levels mm -hmm. underneath it and the organ the organizational structures and laws. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, should follow. So, I, well, and there is this important apparatus of the law. I mean, that's part of what Title IX offers us. That's part of what the Office of Access and Equity um, does is is enforce the law. The cultural part is, I think, critically important, and that does sort of point to some of the questions about structure that have, that have come forward. So one is about, um, uh, Paul, you sort of mentioned this, about rape culture, mm -hmm. 
and how that exists beyond sexual harassment and beyond the sort of mechanisms of individual interactions, mm -hmm. and a question about toxic masculinity, which I see as part of rape culture. In other words, what part of the very fabric of our institution, the daily processes of interaction, the way we sort of run the business of our institution, as well as the business, business of our lives, really represents a kind of privileging of masculinity, of privileging of maybe heteropatriarchy, of these kind of big of, of white supremacy, like how does that all get sort of trickled down into how we interact with each other one by one? And again, it's a big question, but I think the questions that are coming forward from the audience, some of them are saying that has to be part of the discussion, mm -hmm. not only how to improve and streamline maybe the reporting mechanisms when a graduate student feels like there's been a case of sexual harassment, right? Mm -hmm. So that wasn't a question, I'm just sort of reflecting okay. one of these. Okay. There is one specific question I want to make sure we get to, because I think it was actually a very brave and important question to mm. ask. And that is, um, paraphrasing it, so one of the things we've tried to do on this panel is tell the history of the Me Too movement, including the places where it is a complicated movement that invites us to think differently about race, class, gender, mm -hmm. sexuality, et cetera. And the question really is about if by doing that, centering women of color, reminding the history as we all have done about particular groups of women who are most marginalized being at the forefront of the organizing, if we do that, does it not discount um, the experiences of white women does it not um, erase the kind of leadership of maybe even white men? And how does this not get to be a kind of gymnastics of who's gonna claim the most power and credit for the Me Too movement in the kind of reverse sexism, that's a quote, or reverse racism kind of way? So how do you balance the telling of the the story in one way with the sensitivity to uh, not being exclusionary of other mm -hmm. people? That's a big one. Okay. So um, I think I'll answer it this way um, by referring back to what Shahrazad just asked, remind us about, reminded us about, about centering that 13 year old African American girl. And what that reminds me of is why, I don't remember who said it, so I'll just repeat it, like the, the importance of paying attention to those who have the least kind of social privilege, mm -hmm. because when you kind of attend to what it is that's producing their marginalization, you end up actually repairing much of the entire structure. Mm. So there is actually nothing to lose Mm -hmm. by focusing mm -hmm. on yeah. women of color as who are survivors of violence and beginning the conversation there. There's nothing to lose. All you can do is really understand better what it is that makes people insecure physically, socially, politically, what it is that produces that kind of sense of not belonging, that sense of invisibility. What you will get to see are the ways in which you yourself, maybe as an individual, but also members of your own group are participating in something that you might not even believe in, mm. right? So I don't see, I don't ever see it as a losing position mm. to begin from. Yeah. Um, and I don't have any evidence right now that there, it's actually a losing position. Mm. Because in fact, the, the, the breadth and the richness of the conversation that we're having about violence right now is precisely because we went to those conversations, those spaces that we didn't want to before, mm -hmm. right? When people were excluded, we didn't understand like how class really is core to why people and how people interact with the social services that we thought, you know, the kind of liberal establishment, we believe that that's what was gonna fix the thing. Well, no, it doesn't because there are all these other kind of cultural barriers and repertoires about how you talk about your problems, how you name them, that still keep people out. So if you don't attend to the kind of, 
the core ways in which people are being made to feel inferior in their own societies, right? If we're going to claim to cling to the notion of citizenship, then then you're really not changing very much, mm -hmm. right? And so that's kind of how I would respond yeah. to that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of questions we didn't get to. They surround questions about how, for example, to work with uh, men, how to create openings yeah, for one. those kinds mm -hmm. of discussions about uh, making sure that when we're talking about sexual assault and sexual harassment, we understand how profoundly important they are. There are no such things as, as uh, sort of more, uh, more serious sexual assault and less serious sexual assault. When it happens to you, it is very serious, right? Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate the questions we couldn't get to. I apologize that we're almost out of time to do that. I just want to make one concluding um, appreciation, um, and then I'll turn it back over to the provost if you're <laughs> finishing up, and I'm not sure. Um, one thing I do think that Me Too has has done, it's done many things, but one of the things that it's done that has been profoundly important is give space mm -hmm. for this kind of discussion in these kind of contexts. And it's an appreciation that UIC was willing to kind of answer the call to have an open discussion like this, mm -hmm. but also for people who are survivors in the room who aren't yet ready to disclose that they in fact are, um, are part of the Me Too community, mm -hmm. um, that it's a process, not one that demands a declaration, mm -hmm. but in fact, it is an opportunity to say that when you say Me Too, there is a recept receptivity, there's an audience of people uh, who are ready to hear you, who are ready to mm -hmm. help and offer support. And I will turn to mm -hmm. the campus services mm -hmm. that are here to say, if it is you, then there are people who are willing to hear. You don't have to put it on your social media, but um, in fact, mm -hmm. there, that it mm -hmm. matters a great deal to us in this community that there are people who are survivors and need support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that, I turn it back to the provost. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today.